All right, I would like to welcome everybody to the Washington Native Plant Society Native Plant Appreciation Month. Today marks the first day of this month long celebration full of education, appreciation, and opportunities to advocate for Washington's native flora. Today, Washington Native Plant Society sent out the April E News, which is full of many opportunities to participate. It's a really big, wonderful issue. We welcome you to review the newsletter or visit us online to learn more about these opportunities and join us. The newsletter is also available from the link on the homepage of WNPS.org for those who do not regularly receive it. I'm also very happy to announce that it's also the first day of the first national native plant month as unanimously resolved recently by the US Senate. This is a, a wonderful acknowledgement of the importance of native plants. We also welcome you all to join us on April 10th for our featured event with Douglas Tallamy, a guide to the little things that run the world. This event is open to all members and to the general public. Please share this opportunity with your network. Tonight, we are honored to kick off this event with an address on gratitude and land acknowledgement provided to us by Fern Renville. Fern Naomi Renville is a Dakota storyteller, theater director, playwright, educator, and enrolled citizen of the Sistun Wapaton Oyati. Fern's joy is in sharing the theatrical story tradi storytelling traditions of the Dakota Winter Lodge, a mythic story arc that describes the relationships between all living things. Fern has collaborated with a diverse array of institutional and tribal partners to bring communities together on stage for cultural learning. And most recently, Seattle Sound Theater produced a free downloadable audio play for all ages that is based on in traditional story and supports Washington State's since time immemorial tribal history and sovereignty curriculum. I will put the URL to this wonderful sounding pro, uh, play in the chat. Fern has been selected to serve as a member of the Humanities Washington's 2021-2022 Speakers Bureau well, she will explore the past, present, and future of the female indigenous power in traditional stories. So without further ado, let me welcome Fern and thank you very much for being here. Um, Hello, my relatives. Thank you for that very kind and very long introduction. <laughs> um, my name is Fern Naomi Renville. I am Sistan Wapitan. That's an Eastern Dakota band. My homelands are in the Twin Cities and um, the Lake Traverse Reservation of South Dakota, which is where my family is enrolled and, and where we live. Like yourselves, I am a guest on these Coast Salish lands. And in coming here, I've learned so much about the stories and traditions of this place, and also about the treaty, the um, Point Elliott Treaty of 1858, I believe, which gave Coast Salish tribes legal stewardship of lands. And that's the um, tribal sovereignty that is the, um, big tool in the courts that tribes used to protect Mother Earth. However, it's not the law that gives Coast Salish people here, or Dakota people in my homeland, the right to that stewardship. It's our cultural and spiritual ties to this land that um, is worth recognizing. And I'm so excited to be here for you with the Native Plant Society because all of the plants that you're stewarding are the traditional re relatives of 
Coast Salish people. So um, in my Dakota worldview, when I say, hello, my relatives, I mean, we're all related because we're all the children of Kushi Makah, not just humans to one another, but humans to plants and animals and land and water. So the lichens are our relatives and they're much older than us. So they have a lot to teach us because they are elders. So thank you for allowing me to give this land acknowledgement, give an acknowledgement to the Coast Salish people, the ancient Duwamish, the Muckleshoot, who steward these lands, both in the courts with tribal sovereignty and with ceremony and long relationship with the relatives right here. Thank you. We'll be done. Thank you very much. Um, I would also like to mention that we will be taking questions. You can put your questions in the chat or the Q&A. I will warn you that if you click on the raise hand button to out of curiosity, it will raise your hand, which you may or may not want to do. Um, and I will collect the questions and try to group questions on similar topics and we will answer the questions at the end of the presentation. So at this time, I would like to introduce Yanka Hobbs, who is the chair of the CPS or Central Puget Sound chapter. And she'll have a few announcements and then we'll take it from there. I would also like to once again, thank Fern Renville for her lovely words. Yes, thank you, Fern. Welcome to the um, Central Pug WNPS Central Puget Sound Chapters um, West Side um, monthly meeting. Um, and welcome to Native Plant Appreciation Month. We will, um, chapter announcements are that we will be having our um, spring plant sale, which you will, be, which will be open to start ordering on April 9th, order through the website, and then you'll be able to pick up your or make a schedule a um, time to pick up your order um, either May 8th, 8th or 9th um, at um, 21 acres in Woodenville. Um, and the the website to, the ordering shop will be open um, technically until the twenty sixth or until we sell out or fill up our um, pickup spots. So um, please order early and often. And um, please go to the website. There are many many wonderful um, webinars and other activities posted. Um, both from our chapter and the other chapters and from the um, society in general. So if you're if you're not if you're not there, go outside. And I'm going to pass this on to um, Shelley um, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you. Good evening. Glad to be here. Thank you, Fern. Uh, for your thoughtful introduction in words. Um, tonight, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Lalita Calabria. Dr. Calabria is a member of the faculty at the Evergreen State College, where she teaches a variety of interdisciplinary team and solo taught programs focusing on vascular plants, lichens, bryophytes, fungi, field ecology, taxonomy, herbarium studies, and plant chemistry. In addition to her teaching responsibility, she is also the collections manager at the Evergreen Natural History Museum, where she is actively involved in mentoring students and conducting herbarium-based research. Dr. Calabria earned her PhD in plant biology at the University of Te Texas at Austin in 2008. Her current research and publications focus on the biodiversity 
and conservation of North American lichens and bryophytes. She enjoys spending time in the field and lab with undergraduate students, conducting floristic surveys and documenting rare and endemic lichen and bryophyte species. Please join me in giving Dr. Calabria a warm welcome. You can't hear us clap, Lolita, but um, you're on. And thank you again for doing this. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here today. And Fern, thank you for that beautiful land acknowledgement. I'm so lucky to, um, to be here to speak with you about our relatives, the, the bryophytes and lichens. And so um, I want to start off by saying that um, I want to apologize to the folks who attended the Washington Botanical Symposium this time last year, because this talk will be very similar to the one I presented then. And and no one could have predicted then what our year has been like, but it's great to be here talking about uh, one of my favorite topics with you, the biodiversity and conservation of bryophytes and lichens on the Puget Sound prairies. So I became interested in this topic um, back in 2013. And if, uh, as many of you live in the Puget Sound, you know that one of the most spectacular places to botanize is the Puget Sound Prairies, uh, an amazing diversity of native plants that you can find here. And what I realized pretty quickly was that there was this overlooked um, diversity that, that we weren't really paying attention to too closely uh, with the bryophytes and the lichens that occur in these prairies. And so you can see here on this opening slide that there was many, many different um, institutions and uh, agencies involved in this project. And I, this work could not have been possible without them, especially the land managers who, who were so generous with their time in supporting me and my undergraduate students and my collaborators in going out to the different prairie sites and collecting and, and um, setting up our research. So I wanna war warmly thank all of our collaborators to begin with. So um, as many of you know, the prairies are home to many rare and endemic vascular plant and animal species. Uh, just some notable ones, we have the Taylor's checker spot butterfly and the Castilea levisecta, the host plant for that butterfly. And a lot of the management is geared towards uh, creating the kinds of environments that these organisms will thrive in. And one of those uh, management tools is prescribed fire. And uh, out on the prairie, I wondered how, they, how this prescribed fire might be impacting our bryophyte and lichen communities and just what bryophyte and lichen communities occurred in these prairies. And we do know, well, as I began my studies there, um, I was aware that we had some um, interesting lichens like the reindeer lichen that you can see here on the left as an example. And that, that were pretty abundant in certain patches of these prairies and was just quite unusual for this um, far inland. And so it was really neat to see those there. And I wondered, you know, maybe there's a story here to look into. And so I started off by doing some research on what had already been done. And there was a few unpublished species lists for lichens and bryophytes uh, for Mima Mounds and Glacial Heritage Preserve. Um, there was a foray with a Northwest lichenologist and a couple of uh, checklists put together by Judy Harpel and um, uh, Virginia Ellis. And I read some studies that had uh, looked at the impacts of fire on reindeer lichen populations in the Willamette Valley prairies. And so that was a little bit um, intriguing to me. And I knew that there had been some publications about kind of the distribution and the diversity of different kinds of rare reindeer lichens at Mima Mounds. And so this was kind of the foundation of where we started. And so here's kind of the overarching questions that we were interested in tackling first. First of all, what species occur and where? And so there is several different prairie preserves across the Puget Sound that we wanted to visit and document diversity of species. We wanted to get a sense of how abundant these different species were. And we wanted to know what we could learn about their ecological or their functional roles in prairie ecosystems so that we could help to inform the management practices that could help to preserve any rare species and protect um, the functions that they're providing to these ecosystems. 
And so this is tied to how prescribed burning practices that are so important for some of our vascular plant um, and animal species for maintaining the open prairie landscape and um, preventing the encroachment of Douglas fir, for example, um, and invasive species, how was this affecting our bryophyte lichen communities? So we're gonna focus on this first point to start. And so one of the benefits that I have of being a professor at Evergreen is I have all of these amazing undergraduate students who are eager to get out and learn about these topics. And so uh, during 2012 and 2013, we did some initial surveys um, with some members of the Northwest Lichenologists and uh, my undergraduate students visiting seven different prairie sites across Puget Sound. This map um, shows the historic range of our grasslands and then what is remaining is, um, well, the historic range is kind of this orange color and the yellow is the current area. So you can see that we've lost a lot of our habitat and then these green areas are these protected areas that we were able to visit. Mima Mounds, Glacial Heritage, Scatter Creek, West Rocky Prairie, Tenalquat Prairie, and Johnson's Prairie. And then over here, Training Area 15 on Joint Base lewis mccord was also one of our initial sites. And so at each of the sites, we wanted to look at areas that had been burned and ones that, had, that were, haven't been burned, burned in recent management history. And we used a standard size um, plot and we used a method of basically um, doing a thorough survey inside of each of these plots, looking for up to two hours for any new species encountered. And we collected every unique species that we could find and then we took them back to our lab for identification. And so um, we published this checklist in 2015. Here's some of my undergraduate students that were really um, instrumental in, with that work. And we were able to record 32 bryophyte and 32 lichen species across those different sites. And um, we were able to document some rare lichen populations, which was really great. And I thought I would give you some of the highlights from that publication. Um, so we have bryophytes that were common in unburned plots. And um, Let's see here. So a lot of these uh, mosses, just to kind of give you a sense of, um, without knowing the species in particular, you can still tell a lot by thinking about their growth forms. That gives you some sense of kind of when they come in, in terms of succession. So we have a lot of feather mosses, large cushions and turf. So mosses that take a little bit longer to establish, like we have Rytidia delphus triquetris, Rachometrium elongatum. This is a really common rock on, um, sorry, a really common moss on rocky kind of gravelly soil, likes a lot of that full sun. Uh, Cleopodium crispifolium, this dicranum scoparium, which is this kind of tall turf moss. And then this last one is underneath my zoom window, so I can't see it very well, but it looks like it's probably oh, a brachythesium, brachythesium albicans. So these were some of the more common ones in our unburned plots. And then I want to draw your attention to these two because I'm going to come back to this for another story I'm going to tell later about uh, an interesting finding that we made in the last couple years. And then in terms of common and burn plots, we see more disturbance adapted bryophytes, uh, ones that are shorter lived, have a shorter life cycle and reproduce more quickly, more weedy species. And so if you can imagine that when prairies are burned um, frequently, you basically get down to the bare mineral soil. And these are species that are able to um, uh, establish in those conditions. So we have Funaria hygrometrica, Polytricum uh, juniperinum, uh, Bryum caspiticium, Ceratodon purpureus, Pleuridium subulatum and uh, Cephalosiella. And so these were really fun because um, these are really easy to overlook. And we were, you know, basically down on our hands and knees in the soil, looking at little gopher holes and little divots in the soil. And we're able to find these more, this Pleuridium in particular. Yeah, burn plot tip. Is more of a. 
turf moss and more. Um, um, is more of a ephemeral species here. And you can see they have very little gametophyte or leafy tissue. And they're basically just, the whole thing is just this giant sporophyte or the capsule that holds the spores. And so this, these were really fun to go out on the prairie in the springtime and to see these. And then the cephalosiella, I always joked with my students that it basically just looks like dirt. And so you really have to get in there because you, it actually looks like soil because the tiny, tiny little leaves are so um, dark and pigmented at times that they blend in so well. But they were present in a lot of our, our burned plots. So that is some of our more common species in burned plots. Okay, so then moving on to the common lichens. Um, most of the lichens that we found, the vast majority belong to the genus Cladonia. And there was lots of diversity of cladonia species, so almost 30 cladonia species. Um, the most common that we found in the unburned plots were the species belonging to the cladonia chlorophaea group, which you would um, maybe know as pixie cups. They have these goblet shaped uh, cups on top of these stalks that we call podicia with a little bed of squamules, these little kind of leafy structures that create the kind of um, cover on the substrate. We have Cladonia verruculosa, which looks like long kind of dark purplish green fingers coming up from the grass. We have Cladonia fricata featured here, lots of that there on the soils all around um, and, and intermixed with the grass. And Cladonia portentosa, this is one of the more common reindeer lichens and these, these look like giant puffs of cotton growing intermixed at Mima Mounds, for example, in between the mounds. And then um, these two are examples of uh, lichens that have nitrogen fixing bacteria as their photosynthetic partner. So um, most lichens have uh, green algae as their photosynthetic partner because algae, um, excuse me, lichens are a symbiotic relationship between a fungus and a photosynthetic partner like an algae or a cyanobacteria. And so this one, Peltigera leucophlebia, it's really beautiful and kind of grows intermixed and on top of the mosses and the soil. And it has both a green algae and a cyanobacterial partner. And the cyanobacteria grow in these little black speckles on the surface of the lichen thallus. Whereas this one, um, let's see, Peltigera neopolydactyla, this one has only the cyanobacteria partner. And so you see that it's a darker kind of an army green color, whereas the green algal lichens are more of a bright green color. And so those were some of the uh, lichens that were restricted to the unburned plots. Okay, and then in terms of some of our rare um, species, we were able to uh, find some new records for the S1 critically imperiled uh, ranked state ranked lichen Cladonia novochlorophaea. This is a picture of it. It's um, you can see why um, these can be kind of overlooked. It's not something that if you found you'd be like, oh, I need to collect this one. This is special. I mean, it's pretty much easily overlooked. Uh, it could be more common than than we think um, because it's not collected that frequently. And then we have Cladonia concina. This is kind of a Dr. Seuss looking um, lichen. It has cups within cups within cups. It's so beautiful and delicate. And, and it has kind of these, this very slender, delicate look to it. And all known Washington collections are from the South Puget Sound bioregion. So this seems to be kind of an endemic to this area, at least in Washington. And then uh, the reindeer lichens, in terms of Cladonia ciliata, variation tenuous, and variation ciliata, these are also state ranked as critically imperiled. And you can see here the contrast between the two um, colors. This is just a chemical difference. It's not that this one is dead. It's actually just lacking in a particular chemical that this one has. Um, and so it's really cool to see this in the field. There's really a stark contrast of these intermixed, um, uh, you know, cotton puffs of Cladonia, these reindeer lichen. 
Okay, so that's some documentation of what species we found. And next we wanted to document the abundance. And in order to do that, we were going to estimate percent cover in a series of smaller plots within the same plots that we collected uh, diversity data on. And so we limited our, um, our abundance surveys to five different sites. And we used, again, one burned and one unburned plot per site. And then within each of the plots, we had 32 microplots. So um, if you're looking here, you can see that there's kind of this cross in, in the middle of this circle, which, are, which is our whole plot. And everywhere along these, these four transects, we laid out these microplots. And here you can see some of my students estimating the percent cover of the, the uh, bryophytes and lichens in these plots. And uh, what we measured in each microplot was the percent cover, the mat depth. And so at each corner of the plot, we took a sample of the depth of the moss mat or the lichen mat. And this helped us uh, to estimate biomass. And so you know, if you think about forest biomass and how much carbon is stored in a forest, you can think about all of the carbon in the trees. But in an open landscape like prairie, there's not a lot of large biomass trees in that system. So really it's in the ground layer. And we were really interested in finding out how much biomass or carbon is being stored in this, in this ground layer. It also helps us to understand nutrient cycling for the um, Puget Sound prairies. So that was an, an important feature that we wanted to collect data on. And then in terms of um, documenting what kinds of bryophytes or lichens grow in, uh, in at calculating the percentage, instead of using species, which can be much more difficult to estimate in the field, especially for beginners, um, many of these species we had to key out in the lab using uh, microscopes. And so it wouldn't be possible to get the kind of accuracy you would need with just working in the field. And so instead we collected data in functional categories. And hopefully the hope is that these categories will help us to learn something about the role of these lichens and bryophytes in the ecosystem. For example, um, as I mentioned, some lichens fix nitrogen and because they have that cyanobacteria photosynthetic partner. And so documenting that helps us to understand how those nitrogen fixing organisms are distributed across the landscape and how much nitrogen they might be contributing to the ecosystem as a whole. Um, another important category that we wanted to understand more about was the forage lichen, um, which is the reindeer lichen. So they're called reindeer lichen is their common name because they're eaten by reindeer. Uh, we don't have reindeer here, but we have elk. And one of the things that I would love for someone to study is to do some wildlife cams to see if we can document elk um, eating the reindeer like, and I'm not sure if it's known, but I know that prior to um, uh, the, 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 the fragmentation of this landscape, um, there was a, you know, elk herds that traveled pretty continuously through this area. We still see some sometimes that they're here, but it's kind of unknown how much of a food staple that would have been um, in the past. And so that's something that would be really interesting to learn more about. Okay, so that was kind of the method that we used. And this is just a table summarizing our results. So looking at, um, you know, what can we say about how fire impacts these different traits that we measured, cover and biomass, by looking at comparing what we found in our burn plots to our unburned plots. And I'm pointing out two categories here. And the number on the left of the plus and minus sign is the total uh, kilograms per hectare in biomass. Um, and then this is the standard deviation. So there's quite a bit of variation between plot. That's what this high standard deviation tells me. But what you can see is that under unburned plots uh, exhibited uh, well, I'm sorry, I should say it the opposite way. Burn plots exhibited a 72% decrease in biomass, which would be expected because we're burning up a lot of that ground layer. And cover 
had less, less of a drastic impact. We see the difference of only between 33% um, percent cover in burned versus 54% percent cover in unburned plots. And I think why we don't see a large difference in cover, but a very significant difference in biomass is because the community composition changed. So there was other lichens and bryophytes, mostly bryophytes actually, that uh, were more adapted to that disturbed soil environment of a free of a recent burn. And so the community composition shifted, but there still was a, a fairly regular cover of, uh, of bryophytes in those plots. So um, this is another graph from this paper that we published about the effects of fire on bryophyte and lichen communities. And I think it's an, a nice visualization to show if we look at these different functional categories, whether they be turf moss, feather moss, liverworts, or ephemeral mosses. Those were the pluridium subulatum, the little um, kind of short-lived um, large sporophyte uh, bryophytes that I showed you in the beginning. And then the, the darker symbols are the lichen categories. So forage lichen, nitrogen fixing, and other, which was mostly cladonia. And what you can see, this side is showing lichen and bryophyte biomass, and this side is showing cover. And what you see basically is that all functional categories decreased in the burn plots, except for one, which is the ephemeral mosses. So this created a special niche that these bryophytes were better adapted to. And then what we see here is um, that the cover went down of all functional groups, again, except for the, for the um, ephemeral mosses. And unfortunately, we almost go to zero with the forage lichens. So burning decreased the biomass of all the functional groups except for the femoral mosses. And it really um, helped to uh, illustrate that some lichen populations could be at risk for extirpation from these sites, including some rare species, with uh, the burning, with these burning practices, because they, uh, they're basically removed with the fire, the intensity of the fire that's happening. Um, and so that was a good piece of information for managers to have, and they've been working to um, integrate this data with their management plans and have been, uh, you know, careful to take measures to prevent these organisms from getting burnt up when they do have to burn areas. So that's been really great to see. So the third project and the final project that I want to share with you is a really exciting one that we finally just finished and published. And um, my collaborators on this project were Amanda Bidwell, um, a graduate student at uh, UW, who's recently graduated, uh, Sarah Hammond, uh, who you can see here, restoration ecologist, and Kate Peterson's one of my former students. And um, she's now gone gone off to get a degree in uh, science communication, a master's degree in science communication, which is awesome. And this is a picture that one of my former students took of the cyanobacteria that grow on the moss leaves. So basically what happened is um, I came across this paper that was published a while ago that was looking at boreal forest mosses and that they actually these mosses, it's not just lichens that have net associations with nitrogen fixing bacteria, but it turns out that um, several moss species can have associations with cyanobacteria that grow epiphytically on the moss leaves. So this is a epifluorescent microscopy image of moss leaves. And you can see that looking with regular uh, light microscope image, you can't really see much, but if you use, um, this fluorescence microscopy, you can see these communities of cyanobacteria that live on the leaves. And what they were finding in this paper was that these mosses were fixing nitrogen and that there was a seasonal pattern to it where we see more nitrogen fixation um, at different times of year, depending on precipitation and light and different environmental variables. And that it what before this was known, um, basically the there was a missing piece of a of the total annual end budget for boreal forest they couldn't figure out where the nitrogen was coming from until they figured this out 
And so that was really intriguing to me. And um, so what they do, how they do this, this process, how do they measure nitrogen fixation? Well, it's really kind of interesting. So the bacteria that live on the moss, the cyanobacteria, they have an enzyme called a nitrogenase and it's able to take nitrogen gas that is in the air, N2, and it's able to break it down and uh, transform it into a form uh, eventually forming into ammonium that plants can utilize for growth. And so it frees up this atmospheric nitrogen using this enzyme. Well, it turns out that if you feed these cyanobacteria acetylene gas, they treat it the same way and they can convert that triple bond in the acetylene into a product called ethylene. So you can measure acetylene reduction as a proxy for nitrogen fixation. And so we wondered, some of these same species that grow in the boreal forest also happen to grow in the Puget Sound prairies. And so we were wondering if, first of all, can we find cyanobacteria growing on the leaves of these bryophytes? And if so, can we quantify how much is occurring and figure out how much they might be contributing to the annual nitrogen budget for Puget Sound prairies? So, um, some students started looking under the microscope. We have an epifluorescence microscope at Evergreen at some of these species. And lo and behold, we were able to find cyanobacteria growing on the leaves of these species. And you might remember back to the beginning of my talk about the Rhytidiodelphus triketris and the Rhacometrium, which are two really common species on the prairies. And then Pylocomium splendens and Pleurosium also occur kind of on the edges of the forest prairie boundary. And we wanted to include these in our study because these were present, these are very abundant in the boreal forests. And so it would be really nice to be able to measure the same species in different ecosystems and at different latitudes. And so the primary objectives of this part of our, of our work was to quantify the temporal and the spatial variation of end fixation rates. So were they, is it different at different prairie sites? Is it different at different times of year? We also wanted to understand how climatic drivers might be influencing these patterns. So can we correlate um, any seasonal differences with the nitrogen rate, fixation rates, or precipitation levels? and other climatic factors. And then we wanted to be able to take this data and estimate how much nitrogen might be um, available to plants in the ecosystem by the presence of these bryophytes. So um, Amanda Bidwell is, this, is the person who had access to this um, acetylene reduction, an instrument for measuring acetylene reduction. And so you can see some moss samples here in these little vials. And so we collected triplicate samples for each of our target moss species at the three different prairie sites uh, at one month intervals over a 12 month period. And so um, we, every month we collected and then we analyzed these samples in the lab using the acetylene reduction assay that I explained, uh, where we incubated the moss samples for 24 hour period with the acetylene gas. And we measured the uh, acetylene reduction using a gas chromatograph uh, flame ionization detector. And then we converted that data into micromoles of acetylene reduced per meter squared per day to as a proxy for nitrogen fixation. And what we found is that there was nitrogen fixation happening, that uh, Rhacometrium elongatum was, was by far the most active moss um, in our nitrogen fixation association. There was some fixation happening with Rhytididelphus triketris and Pleurosium shrubberi, but not nearly as much as with Rhacometrium elongatum. And you can see that we do see a seasonal pattern. So just let me have you focus on the top graph first. And so these bars represent the monthly fixation rates of the three combined species. And we can see that there's a peak in, um, well, first that it was highest in Rhacometrium elongatum and that we see peaks in July and April. 
And so um, we also see that uh, on the bottom part of the graph that we're me we measured three different variables, um, temperature, we didn't measure them. We just used existing data on temperature and precipitation from the local weather stations and uh, the day length for that time. And we thought day length might be a factor because of what we know about circadian rhythms in plants and how this can affect different physiological processes. And so we did find a positive correlation with day length with peaks occurring in months that had 13 to 14 hours of daylight um, suggesting that the conditions during this time support fixation for these species. And um, I hope you'll read my paper about this. And if you'd like to learn more about what we think is going on in the moss map, because as you can imagine, you know, mosses don't live as single sprigs. They're kind of live in community with their fellow moss uh, cousins in, the, in these mats. And these mats create an environment that's um, holds moisture very well. So I know you're probably thinking, well, July is like hot and dry, but with imagine being out on that prairie and the dew in the morning and the, the moisture that's being held in that bryophyte mat. And so we think that um, there's definitely a strong relationship between uh, moisture and temperature optima for the cyanobacteria um, in these in these situations. And in future studies, we'd like to actually stick some temperature probes and in, inside the moss mats to find out exactly what's going on and how much if we can look at moisture and temperature within individual mats. So the last thing I want to share is kind of our estimation of how much nitrogen is being um, contributed by these organisms to our prairie ecosystem. And so we looked to the literature to find out what we know about the annual budget for um, prairies in, in North America. And, and there's two kind of estimates out there in the literature for mixed grass prairies and kind of temperate grasslands that tell us about how much nitrogen's in the annual, annually in the ecosystem. And this includes um, contributions from vascular plants and in some cases, uh, some symbiotic associations. Um, you know, some, I'm sure you're aware that some um, vascular plants, like in things in the pea family, have nitrogen fixing associations as well that can contribute. And so um, we found that there was no annual nitrogen bub uh, budget published for Puget Sound Prairie. So we're really relying on these kind of broader estimates. And we calculated that the annual median fixation. We used median instead of mean as a more uh, conservative estimate since there was a lot of variation by site and by species that we measured. And um, for, for Rachometrium elongatum and Trichetris together range from 0 0.008 to 0 0.124 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare based on the percent cover. So Managers can use our formula that we provide as an appendix in the um, publication to plug in their percent cover and find out about how much nitrogen could be being fixed by these organisms at their particular site. And then depending on the cover, the total uh, potential contribution we estimate to be of, you know, including all of the other um, nitrogen contributors in that system to be about 0.1 to 2.5 uh, of the total. And so there's a lot of potential for further research here and um, learning more about these organisms. It's, it was really exciting to make this discovery and find that these organisms occur here. And I hope that others will continue to, um, to learn more about this. I wanna finish by thanking uh, all of our funding and uh, all of the individuals that made these projects possible. In particular, I wanna thank Dave Hayes, Jim Lynch and David Wilderman who helped a lot with the on the ground um, uh, support for getting the work done at these different natural areas. The Northwest lichenologists, especially the folks who helped us ID and verify all of our bryophytes and lichens, Tom Carlberg, Catherine Glue, Carrie Knudsen, John Valella, Daphne Stone, and Bruce McCune, Judy Harpell for all the help with the bryophytes, undergrad, all the undergrad students. These are a couple different um, 
uh, pictures with my lab students who spent so much time working on that acetylene reduction assay and collecting the bryophytes over that year period for the um, for the nitrogen fixation experiment and then all of their hard work with uh, learning how to identify bryophytes and measure all of the different things in the plots. The staff at the Evergreen State College for all their support, all of my co-authors, and you can find these publications on ResearchGate. And that's it. So thank you very much. I'll ha be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Calabria. That was fascinating. We do have some intriguing questions. Um, Frederick Burke popped up with an early one, wondering whether the species are separated with taxonomy or genetic studies. Yeah, so these were all a study, these were all um, classified just by classical taxonomy using dichotomous keys. So we didn't do genetic analysis on any of the samples. Great, thank you. Um, Sawyer Nagel wanted to know if you found that the nitrogen fixing mosses belong to any particular successional, he wrote S-E-R-E, -E, but I don't know if that's, if he meant series or sequence maybe. Yeah, hi Sawyer, glad you could attend. Um, yes, so those uh, bryophytes are more characteristic of later successional habitats. So those would be ones present in the, un more common in the unburned plots. Okay, and then um, Susan Zakwea asked if the nitrogen fixation by bryophytes and lichen, is it beneficial to other nearby plants? And how about if the bryophytes and lichen are located on the branches of bushes and trees? Is there any way for that fixed nitrogen to get through to the bush or tree? Great question. Yeah, actually, I'm so glad you brought that up. So one of the parts of this puzzle that we haven't really um, uh, learned much about, and there's not that much in the literature yet, is what's the fate of the nitrogen that the cyanobacteria are fixing? Is the bryophyte getting that nitrogen? Are the surrounding plants getting the nitrogen? How broad of a of a like an impact do you see on neighboring plants? Is it just the plants that are growing right in the vicinity? And so there are some studies that are starting to pop up addressing this question. It turns out that there's, I mean, I'm sure uh, this is not too unexpected given what we've been learning about uh, the human biome, the microbiome, that there's a a whole bunch of other bacteria that occur on the bryophytes that are non-nitrogen fixing bacteria that have been shown to utilize the fixed nitrogen. So the fate of the nitrogen is one of those um, questions that I'm very fascinated by and really wanna learn more about. And in terms of your question about the, the shrub and the tree layers, um, I do know that there's been some work, including work by my collaborator, Amanda Bidwell, looking at epiphytic uh, bryophyte cyanobacteria associations in the canopies of our temperate rainforests. So we do know that that phenomena extends into the canopies. I did not look at any tree or shrub dwelling species, and I'm not aware of um, the fate of that nitrogen in that situation. I would imagine that much like what we, we have, we expect with um, lichen nitrogen fixation that through leaching, you can get um, when rainfall happens that that nitrogen becomes available to the surrounding plants. But that's a great question. Great, thank you. A question from Carol Eckert. Is this a good time of year to visit our prairies? Oh yes, it's the best time of year. Uh, spring is, uh, is, is the time, it's the premier time. I think in May, late April, May, um, we, have, we normally have Prairie Appreciation Day where Glacial Heritage Preserve is open to the public and you can go and actually see some of the most premier uh, wildflowers on the prairies. Um, I don't know if that's happening this year, unfortunately, due to COVID, but you could look at up uh, Prairie Appreciation Day and on the online and see, see if they're allowing visitors in. Um, I know the Scatter Creek Wildlife Area is open and um, that's also a beautiful place. And there's a a trail that you can walk on and then there's parts of the preserve the natural area that are closed off to the public because it's also a 
place where the Taylor's checker spot butterfly is um, very successfully breeding. And um, if you try to walk in that area, you would just be like covered with butterflies, but they don't let people go in there because they're trying to protect them from getting trampled. But yeah, definitely a good time of year. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, John Anderson asked from a management standpoint, what frequency of burning is detrimental to the old growth lichens and bryophytes, keeping in mind that too infrequent management leads to invasion of the prairies by trees and shrubs and Scots broom, et cetera? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I, um, I don't know the answer to that. I, all I know is that we, we know that some of these species can take you know, 80 to 100 years to grow all the way back. Um, and we, we know that prescribed burning is an important part of, of this ecosystem. And if we didn't do it, we wouldn't have the prairies. And so there's a balance there of trying to create, you know, a, a patchy mosaic of different, um, burn intervals and intensities. Um, and I'm definitely not an expert on, on that, but I, would be happy to continue to consult with the managers who are experts and try to find ways to integrate the different approaches that we need to preserve all of our diversity on the prairies. Great. Rob Roy, I'm thinking McGregor asks, did you predominantly look at micro lichens or were micro lichens also surveyed? The, the first one was macro and right. micro. Yes, we primarily looked at macro lichens. Um, we found a few interesting, I didn't mention it, um, but we did find some interesting stuff that you wouldn't expect, uh, like Diplochistes muscorum, uh, which was kind, it's kind of a bio crust thing. Um, but no, we did not survey specifically or really at all for micro lichens, but that would be another very interesting um, layer to add on to the study for sure. Okay, and then Jenny Shrum asks, how do biophytes and lichens persist on the long term? Do individuals live more than a year? Is there such a thing as old growth cladonia? And if so, how do you think frequency of burn may or may not matter? Great question. For, for bryophytes, there's definitely um, some great papers that were written in the 1950s and 70s, 60s and 70s about um, kind of bryophyte succession and species that, you know, are very short lived, like their life cycle could come and go within a few months to, you know, old growth bryophytes that really take a long time to establish and then grow for a very, very long time. Um, and then for lichens, yeah, I mean, some of these, um, uh, these reindeer lichen mats, like I said, can take, you know, a long time to establish and reach their full glory. And um, it's, yeah, I don't, I don't know any more than that about uh, the, um, the kind of growth and development of those lichens, but uh, it would be great to, to take a time machine back to 200 years ago and see what the prairies looked like. And um, knowing that uh, cultural burning of these prairies by indigenous people has been something that, um, that has happened for a really long time and that we know that it helps to maintain the open status of the prairie. So what role did those uh, reindeer lichen play in those ecosystems and how much of a part of it, a part of those those burned landscapes were they? And I don't think we'll ever know the answer to that, but it's a fascinating question to think about. Great, and then we have a comment from Regina Johnson um, that Prairie Appreciation Day is online only this year. So still feeling the effects of yeah. the thing. Um, Susan, I think it's the same Susan as before, her name is cut off, but she just says, Fan fantastic lecture, thank you so much. And then Shelly says, Shelly Evans, who introduced you, 
In your July measurement, do you think of the bryo, do you think the bryophytes are dormant or photosynthetically active? Could it be that only the cyanobacteria are active while the moss itself is dormant? That's a great question. I think they're active. And, you know, going out there and collecting during that time of year, it's almost like too hot to even be out there. Um, you know, on the prairie, it's so hot, but weirdly you reach down and feel inside of this tight cushion of a bryophyte mat, particularly the racometrium, just the growth form of it. And it's still moist in the inside. So it's crazy, but I think there's enough moisture there. And I think that those cyanobacteria are particularly uh, well adapted to, to make use of that moisture under really high hot conditions. So I think it's, you know, a different story than what we are seeing in the boreal forests um, where, where I bet you the optimal um, temperature level for those cyanobacteria is much lower. Interesting. Um, John Villela says, great talk, Lalita. Thanks, I'm John. going back to this pronunciation, but maybe I can say it well enough so that you know what he means. Uh, how about diplochistes? Dip uh -huh. Diplochistes <laughs> is uh -huh. a parasite on Cladonia, so it would be expected with so many Cladonias. Yes, great point. That's where we found it. Parasitizing Cladonia. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And then Rob Roy McGregor uh, also asks, why do you suppose there was such a big drop in the end fixation in May, June? Good question. You know, one idea actually that I had is um, we could look back at the graph, but um, I wonder if there's a point of saturation you know, with water where gas exchange is limited. And so you don't get the physiological activities of like fixation and, um, and photosynthesis as, as well. And as, as you know, our, our May and June are kind of a gloomy time of year. It's like spring happens and then it just starts pouring for a while. So maybe that has something to do with it, but that's a good question. Okay, well that, oh no, here's another one. Um, <laughs> Susan is back. Which ecosystem, temperate rainforest or prairie has a more diverse bryophyte and lichen population? I'm gonna say temperate rainforests. Okay, and um, Jenny Schramm has another question or comment mentioned that the patches of bryophytes are often moist even ju in July because of the dew. I know that you will, you said you will insert temp probes, which would also allow you to determine dew point and when it is reached. Do you think there's any chance that, that they are also capturing their own respiration moisture or are bryophytes like mammals and that they can't drink what they excrete? Fascinating. Ooh, interesting question. I'll have to spin my wheels on that one for a while. Thanks for bringing that up. Okay. Um, Rob says, fantastic th presentation. Thank you so much for sharing your research. And I'm looking at both the chat and the Q&A and I don't see any more questions. And it's 801, so we're right on time. Thank you so much. It's been a Thank pleasure. You, Dr. Calabria, it was fascinating. I can't wait to get out in the prairie and poke around myself. Thank you.